Welcome to Fusion's worship service. If today is your first time fellowshipping at Fusion, we'd love to know more about you. Please fill in a visitor's card located at the back of our church. Please stay afterwards and get connected with our leaders and other members. Every Tuesday, we have prayer meeting at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary, followed by a Bible study led by Pastor Paolo at 6.30 p.m. Every Thursday, Global Christian Students Gathering meets at 6.30 p.m. at Southwick Hall, room 313 at North Campus. Global Christian Students Gathering is an outreach Bible study for the UMass Lowell students that Fusion members can attend. Dwelling House of Hope is a food pantry at Fusion that serves our community. If you'd like to serve, please come on Thursday starting at 8 or Saturdays from 8 to 12 to help. If you're in need of food, you can also come during those times. We offer English as a Second Language classes for all levels, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. For more information about classes and schedules, please visit fusionlowell.org ESL. Creative Arts and Worship meets every third Sunday of the month after service in the lobby. The Creative Arts and Worship is Kingdom artists presenting their work as a continuation of worship. See Sophia White for details. If you want to give to Fusion, there is a donation box at the back of the church. Or you can give on your mobile phone via Cash App. Our account name is Fusion Lowell. For more information about our church and our activities, please visit FusionLowell.org. Good morning, Fusion. Oh, no, no. We can do better than this. Good morning, my family. Ah, there you go. Love it. How are you all doing? Yeah. So today is our Palm Sunday. Have you grabbed yours? Hey, let me see. How many? How many we have? Oh, we have more in the back there. Feel free to go there, grab one for you. Yeah, there you go. We will sing, and I am going to need your help with the palms, okay? So grab yours in the back, please. Let's praise the Lord today. Amen. I'm excited. I'm just excited, very happy today. I hope you are with me. Amen. I have quick verse that I want to share with you today. Amen. It's Matthew 21. We see when Jesus was preparing to go to Jerusalem. Amen. And we see in Matthew 21, he is giving some instructions to the disciples. Amen. So he said to them, go to the village and soon you guys enter there, you guys going to see a donkey. So grab the donkey. If anybody asks, just tell them he needs it. The Lord needs it. So that's very strong, right? It's like a, I'm going to, let's pick my, my beautiful sister Yolanda here to her house and just said, well, grab her car and just leave and then she asked what are you doing oh the Lord needs your car so I have to take it but the disciples obeyed they obeyed and then we see here when they bring it everything to Jesus we see the prophecy be fulfilled because the prophecy said Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt. So that was the prophecy. Amen. 
So the disciples came and did everything Jesus asked. But the part I want to show it to you is when Jesus come into Jerusalem, his enter, his entrance, Jerusalem. People are putting some translation says um, trees, branches, right? Everything to Jesus, disciples and dunk going to Jerusalem. And they were screaming, shouting. Some translation said, Hosanna, Hosanna, the son of David. Some translation said, blessed of the son of David. So today here, I want to ask you, let's shout it out the name of Jesus in this place. Amen. Let's use this moment to be in his presence and really praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's pray. And let's have a praise and a gratitude prayer today. Amen. So close your eyes with me. And let's thank God for everything he did for us. Because we are preparing for our Easter service. We are just starting. This is just the beginning. Amen. Father, we thank you for the son. Thank you for your son you give to us, Jesus Christ. Oh, we are so thankful today, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you did for us. The sacrifice, the high price you paid for me, for all of us here. So we thank you. We praise you. We worship you. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. We are here to glorify your name and praise you in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of Jesus. We are here to praise you and worship you, Lord, because you were the one who deserved the honor, the glory. Oh, you deserve it all. We just surrender everything to the feet of Jesus today. And we come to you humble, but with our heart full of gratitude. Our heart is full of worship. Our heart is full of praises. We want to say praise the Lord in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna is the Son of God to the Son of God to the Son of David. Hosanna, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You ready? I see the King of Glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes. The whole earth shakes. Hmm. I see His love in mercy rushing.
of God today. Amen. Come on. Blessing assurance. Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire. Time after time. Born in his spirit. Washing his
Hallelujah. He's never failed. You can trust the Lord. You can put on faith in Him. He is a faithful God. He is our promise keeper. If He promised you, He will keep it. He keeps His promise. Perfect the submission. All is at rest. I know the author of tomorrow is ordered my steps. Mm, so this is my story. Yeah. And this is my song. I'm praising. this words of yourself come on you have to prophesy this any answer i saw the lord it's not my word it's the word of god prophesy of yourself sing in faith today oh this battle is not
not belong to you anymore. It belongs to Jesus. That's why I trust in God. It's my Savior. Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can praise the name of Jesus today. I'm telling you, whatever is going on in your minds, whatever is going on in your life, just trust Him. Just trust Him. Let's step into the throne of God today with gratitude, in faith. Let's think, give thanks to God today. Even though you haven't received yet, but that's faith. That's faith. Let's do it. Let's do it. God is challenging us today. I can feel it. He's challenging us. So let's take the challenge. Amen. Hallelujah. To trust Him. Even though you haven't received yet. Trust Him. Come on. Trust Him. Hallelujah.
for the lamb and with the lion and with the eagle and the vision of the man was that one day God would become man and the vision of the calf or the lamb would be that one day that God man would be sacrificed but the vision of the lion was that one day he would rise again and the vision of the eagle is that he would be ascended into heaven and so we thank you that you are the God, man, lamb, sacrifice, calf, lion, and eagle. You are not one-dimensional. You are three in one. You are not a made-up, contrived thing in our heart. You are beyond us. You are three-dimensional. You are someone and something that surpasses us in every way. And lots of people don't like it. And we used to not like it, but now we do. We have humbled ourselves before you. The man, the calf, the lamb, the lion, and the eagle. Alleluia. We worship you today. We know why they laid down those palm trees. We know why they laid them down. We know why they put them at your feet, because you are worthy. No dirt could ever stick to your feet anyway. No sin or false accusation would ever hold true. Alleluia. We worship you today. We prepare for Holy Week, the week set apart for your passion, when you would be the Lamb, and we look forward to the celebration of Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, one week from today, when we proclaim what makes you different than anyone else that ever lived and walked this world. And everybody said, amen. amen. Please be seated.
Any first timers today? We see some first time people. Welcome to Fusion. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Praise God. We also, there's lots of announcements, some of which will be given at the end, but none bigger than we're one week away from our Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday service. And so please do all you can because this is the highlight of the Christian calendar. It's not uh, Christmas, as some might think, but it's, it's absolutely next Sunday. I'm going to have the kids go to Sunday school. Yeah, children, line up over here, meet your teachers. We're going to be re- reading from Isaiah 53, verse 7. He's got a lot of notes today. Buckle up. The title of the message is The Silent Lamb. Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. I was going to read that section of Isaiah 53, three or four verses. By Tuesday, I was down to two verses. And by today, I was down to one verse, unless you guys want to be here till Easter. And (laughs) this thing is packed. And so... I'm really going to focus most of my time on the second half of this verse. I had this image of us, all this work in Isaiah, and I've done Zechariah and some other Old Testament books. We have a mosaic above the baptism tank, my right, your left, that was left to us. And mosaics are little chips of tile and stone, painted or naturally colored, and put together to form a pattern. And we've all seen things, and there's a perfect example of one. But really, the Old Testament and so many passages in Isaiah are just little shards and chips of who Jesus is. Imagine it as a portrait of Jesus. Imagine each little piece of the mosaic that God painstakingly put down. But when you get to Isaiah 53 in this verse here, which again was written 700 years before Jesus walked the earth, this section in this chapter has to be the absolute heart of Jesus that's being portrayed here. This is the very heart of who Jesus is, and if it was a portrait, it would be his blessed heart. I want to talk about this idea of the lamb. I'm going to talk a little bit about suffering innocence, but I'm going to talk a lot more about the strength, the paradox of the strength that's in this verse. You see, it says he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. The drift of this verse is, and this was his answer. His answer was, he answered not. So, While we wouldn't think of sheep as being an emblem or an example of strength, we're going to see that that's what's happening in this passage. The silence here is not the silence of defiance or silent protest, sort of holding your fist up and being quiet. 
While that may show a modicum, a drop, an ounce of power, we're going to show, and I'm going to take it my thing as my mission today to show that the submission of Christ was the ultimate show of power. The restraint of Christ was the ultimate show. This is not a silent protest. This is not someone, as we're going to see, muttering under their breath. The word oppressed is used repeatedly in Exodus to describe the Jewish people in Egypt in bondage. And so, there's this drift. There's many translations of the Bible I almost always read from the NIV. There is a literal translation of the Bible that says, It has been exacted, and he hath answered and he opened not his mouth. Now, the word exacted doesn't mean exact or precise. Or it does mean that, but not in this context. The word exacted also means to demand and obtain payment by force. And some of you may be familiar with the term to exact revenge. Some people say extract revenge, which is an egg corn, not egg corn, acorn, but they say the word wrong. I always used to do that a lot and still do that up here all the time. But it's the word exact. And the word exact means to demand and take by force. And so it says essentially that here it comes, here Jesus is, they exact from him and demand payment. Payment for what? What in the world could the devil demand payment from the devil, from from Jesus for? Our sin. They demanded, the enemy demanded the wages of sin is death, and he demanded that he be paid for the death of mankind, our race, damnation. And Jesus, it says, answered. He answered with no words. Sometimes no answer. Silence is the greatest strength, and we're going to see that today. He's likened to a lamb before it shearers. And the shearing of a lamb in those days was done by hand where each individual, shepherd, each individual sheep would go before the shepherd and they would have to, by hand, cut the wool off the sheep. That's what to shear means. They didn't have electric and machines and things that could do it. They had fairly rudimentary blades and scissors and metal that they had to constantly be sharpening. You sharpen a sword or a knife or a scissors in those days on what? A stone. That's called to wet the stone. Not wet as in spit on it, W-E-T, but W-H-E-T, to wet the stone. To prepare it and then to use the stone to sharpen it. And that's still done today. Many chefs do that, right, Josh? They take that out, and and then they're ready to go. And so you have to picture this imagery of first these sheep are put into this place where all the, the broken pieces of little sticks and dirt and everything is on them, and they're put in a river or a pond somewhere and cleaned off, and then they're brought their wool over. And sheeps give every year of their life back to their shepherds a payment, right? I mean, what payments do pigs give? They give nothing until they die, you see? And you could say, well, chickens give eggs, but eggs last a few days, a few weeks. Or let's just say a cow's milk lasts a few days. Eggs last a few weeks. But a sheep's wool 
last for years and decades even. And, and so there's this idea of this payment. And you have this point, my three main points. First of all, that he doesn't open his mouth. We have Jesus here as a victim, the unresisting animal, suffering innocence, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And there's a secret to his attractiveness by being that way. I'm actually not going to emphasize that that much. I'm going to focus a lot more on his strength today. The hidden power of this verse and of Jesus being portrayed here. Then we have the sacrificial death. He didn't just die a martyr's death. He didn't just a good person who died. We're talking about God who chose to die. He chose to get on the cross. It was an act of love, which is different than just a righteous person being punished for something they did. Death is the ultimate test of love. Death on a cross is the pinnacle of that test. It's the most convincing of that. So we have Jesus as an example, as the sheep, as the victim. Then we have the, excuse me, the second part is, is of him as, as an example. I'm going to go into these points in detail later. That example of Jesus suffering for us is the example that we all need. A suffering world needs a suffering example. And that's Jesus. And the third thing is, is that there's got to be some lessons for us. There's the obvious lesson of that Jesus suffered so much for us and died for us is completely humbling of how enormous our sin must have been. But there's then, how then should we live and what should we do in light of this? So let's start at the beginning. I think it's safe to say that none of us would ever have dare call Jesus a sheep if Scripture itself didn't call Jesus a sheep. We would never dare do that. We could understand calling Jesus the shepherd, but to call him the sheep, that's what is done here in Isaiah 53, 7. Of all the animals, the sheep is picked in the heart of this chapter. It seems to be such a condescending figure for someone like Jesus. But we're going to see that there's a compare and contrast. We are like sheep. What? In that same scriptures that have all gone astray. So we are like sheep in our wanderings. He is like a sheep in its patience. We are like sheep in what? Foolishness, stupidity. He is like a sheep in his submissive spirit. And so it's a different attribute of the sheep. There's two things going on at the same time. They both are true. That we are like sheep and he is like a sheep. That's what it's saying to you. I don't, know if I, can pay, I don't know if I can really preach this. I'm going to a few times just say, look at this. And try to use your mind's eye to see what happened and who Jesus is. Who he, when he walked on this earth and even today. So I want you to see him in your mind's eyes. As the sheep being brought to the shearers. Silent or even being brought to the slaughter when it comes to the cross, and he was silent. While he was going to the slaughter people, while he was going and he was before the Roman soldiers and the people that spit on him and punished him and mocked him and jeered at him, you don't hear one bitter word come out of Jesus' mouth. Not one bitter word. He learned something. He knew something. He's teaching us something. 
that with bitterness and resentment, you lose twice. You get that? With bitterness and resentment, you lose twice. Walk with me down memory lane. See him before Pilate. Pilate, who's trying to get a read on Jesus. And all Jesus will say, for this reason I was born into the world, that I may bear witness to the truth. Jesus could have said, Pilate, I know your wife had a dream about me. Maybe you should listen to it. Pilate, washing your hands is not going to wash that sin off your hands. Only my blood will. He could have said a lot of things to Pilate. He could have complained about the Roman rule, about the politics of the day. He could have said, your empire will not last, but my people will last till I come again. But he didn't do those things. And he goes from Pilate and he's with Herod. And Herod, who lives, though a Jew, like a pagan, like a person that doesn't even believe in God, constantly looking to be entertained, constantly wanting diversion and entertainment. Just like today, our society, never more diversion and entertainment and yet never more boredom at the same time. And then he is before the high priest, Caiaphas, and he's before the soldiers. And all of these times we see this unbelievable restrained power. He says nothing back, no zingers. We don't see him saying anything to his father either. Surely that would be okay. Look at the Psalms. Look at David. Look how he would rail against his enemies in the Psalms. We've all felt that way. He doesn't do that at all. We hear him saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do when he talks to the Father later on. He tells Peter to put away his sword in the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean, Peter and his buddies were just sleeping. They had the big meal. They were tired. They didn't realize what was really going on. Judas comes with all these enemies of Christ, gives him the kiss to betray him. Peter jumps up from his slumber, takes out his sword, cuts off somebody's ear. What does Jesus say? One, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. That's to Peter. And then he just to Peter alone, just to Peter. Peter, don't you know I can call a legion of angels right now? And by the way, tough guy Peter, a little schoolgirl tomorrow is going to scare you away. And you're going to deny me three times. Tough guy. Even at the point of the cross, even at that last minute, the hill of Calvary, couldn't he have just made it a volcano to just whoop? I mean, that's how like a movie would end, right? He'd be ready to get up to the top of the cross. Abraham bringing Isaac up, but then the, lamb, the ram was in the thicket. There's no ram in the thicket for Jesus. This time the father has to sacrifice his son. He was the ram in the thicket. He is the ram in the thicket. You see that? Nothing like this. Trap, the great traps commentary, and I quote this because I, I, I just slightly modified it, but when I was in residency, a learning student doctor, a, a, a intern and resident, we would have what's called a visiting professor come. These were experts in surgery in a particular field, and they would be from another institute, and they would walk around, and they would do rounds, and they would teach us, and maybe even bring us into the operating room. A visiting professor. 
a doctor, a visiting doctor, a professor. Christ on the cross was a visiting doctor, professor, sitting in his chair and reading to all of us a lecture on patience. He was a visiting professor because he was not of this world. He came from heaven. He showed us something that nobody has ever shown before. This is the high point of my message. Christ on the cross, the visiting professor, showing his strength with patience. What strength? Strength, what are you talking about? Just the submission is strength? Yes, but more than that. Not just the submission to these people, but submission to the will of the Father. But submission, let me explain to you this. That remember in Jesus who said, yes, I could call all these angels. That's not even the half of it. He is very God himself. So when he was there... He, in a sense, was restraining omnipotence. So what I'm saying is he himself was all power. And he was restraining all power by submitting and by restraining himself, which is a greater strength than no man can measure. Do you follow me on that? That's incredible. It takes a strong man to restrain another strong man. I've never gone into a club. I don't go into them anyway. I could stop the sentence there. But I've never also been in one and seen this little skinny dweeby guy at the door. Has anybody ever seen that? No, they get these guys that are all juiced up on steroids. Right? Those are the guys there. And, 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 and you're thinking, you're probably not here because you got a PhD in exercise physiology. You're probably here for another reason. Like, I should be good in here. The strength of Jesus here is not testosterone-fueled. It is not bravado. It is not all... The strength here is internal, where true strength lies, the heart. The root word of courage is core, which in Greek means the heart. It's different. A strength that never can be measured. It shows that the, his divine love prevailed over divine wrath. He kept back natural indignation that any man would have. What is indignation but righteous anger? There was an injustice that was going on. There was a falsehood that was going on. There was a shamefulness that was going on. They stripped him of his robes and then they stripped him of everything. He hung on that cross naked. What does it say? He despised the shame endured the cross for the joy set before him. Who is the joy but us? Why would those soldiers not be, how could they be surprised that he was dead already when they checked on him? We talked about this before, if you were here last week. There's a Japanese doctor, sorry for mangling his name, Takutsubu, he noticed that sometimes somebody who was perfectly healthy, an athlete, a wife, a father, would get unbearably bad news. And they would not only mourn and grieve, but that their heart would literally fail on the spot. Broken heart syndrome is what it's called. Broken heart syndrome is a real medical condition. About one in a hundred heart attacks are actually broken heart syndrome. Jesus 
no doubt, looked across the ages and saw each of us, many of us, starting with me, who many a time was completely apathetic to him, didn't care about him one bit. And he could have just said, what am I doing this for? You know what I'm saying? Like, this is just a waste. He never did that. He never went there. His heart fully went into broken heart syndrome. And we talked about when the, when the sword went in and the water and the blood came out. You can tune in to the uh, two weeks ago when I preached on that. I don't, I don't want to go back there. I got to go forward today. But there's just not a trace of that feeling. Read the Gospels. Read the story of Jesus this week. Tell me if you see a trace, a trace of self-pity. A trace of him stepping out of line. In the Old Testament, in Genesis, after Cain kills his brother, Abel, God banishes him away. And then what does Ain, Cain say? My punishment is greater than I can bear. Which seems to me such a strangely lenient <laughs> punishment and such an overwhelming response. Do you follow me? He's just a murderer, and he's like, oh my gosh, I just got punished. I have to go to time out over there. It's more than I can bear. We are like Cain. I am like Cain. I'm working on this message. I'm reading this verse. I have... Somebody at the hospital repeatedly file a report against me at night. And a doctor comes whose job it is to review these reports, a complaint. And this doctor is doing his job and sits, that, sits and talks to me man to man. And I feel the defensiveness rise up. When he says, you were yelling, and I said, but I didn't. And then, about 30 seconds, a minute into this conversation, I remembered this verse. I remembered this verse. I remembered, I failed like Peter. I just felt like God said to me, do you think I just want to teach you this verse so you can teach this on Sunday? Do you think the point of this is so you can make, you know, your points? I mean, it's like the song uh, they sang, uh, my daughter Lily sang a couple of years ago, Sunday Morning Christian. Like, we don't want to be Sunday Morning Christians here. I mean, we want it to be Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. And later in the week, something happened. Something that I thought demanded a reply. And I remembered this thing. And my answer was silence. There was no text back, email back, or phone call back. And I felt just a little teeny bit of it changed a few situations in my life. You see Jesus, when I see him on the cross, the carpenter, a man's man, this was his final project. You see, 
when a carpenter in construction, it will be called a job. It will be called a project, a task. And what I see when I see Jesus on the cross, I see someone focused on his task. Totally focused. You see, the silent one is often that person who's focused. This was years ago. Half of you probably weren't born. I don't remember who it was. It was a relief pitcher for the Yankees. It was like a playoff game, and there was a plague of bugs, and he had a thousand bugs on his face. He was sweating, and he was completely locked on to throwing the next pitch. I don't know if anybody ever saw that. I'm sure you could Google it. Mark this down as the first time I ever said something positive about the Yankees from this pulpit. <laughs> That's the victim. That's who Jesus is. Let's move on to the example. Doesn't it say? I believe it does. I believe that it says somewhere in Scripture, for your sake we are killed all the day long and we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Sound familiar? I think I remember somewhere else, I believe it says, Jesus himself, this part, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. We were regarded as presenting your body as living sacrifices. He is the example to us. Just as the sheep is taken to the shearer and all its wool is cut off. Understand that the Lord takes you to trials and afflictions. Yeah, I said that. He does that. He's not the scissors. He's not the scissors, but he's the one holding the scissors, ultimately. Now comes a harder lesson to explain how in the world, why in the world, when in the world, could possibly God be a shearer? Yeah, we're sheep. Yeah, we need to do this, but why? How? When? What are we talking about? Let's be clear about this. Affliction and suffering is not pleasant. It's not pleasant. Losing a loved one, a spouse, a parent, a child, a job, a house, a situation, a friendship can be extremely and is extremely extremely painful. Just moving, just having to go from one situation to another. So many of you have moved in the last two years. Some of you in the last two months. But I want you to understand that the sheep is benefited by the act of being sheared. I don't know if any of you saw but I think it was two or three years ago, there was a sheep that was found, I think in Australia, that had 80 pounds of wool on it because that wool never stops growing. And it grew over the whole sheep and it weighed the thing down and almost suffocated it, almost to the point where it couldn't couldn't breathe. You see, when the shepherd finds the lost sheep, the lost sheep doesn't look like it looked before it left the fold. You understand that? Doesn't look like that. Don't expect people when they come to God to walk into here and look like they've got it all together. That's not what we're about here. And so... What happened is they pulled that 80 pounds off that sheep and then there's another picture of it. And if sheeps could smile, it was smiling. Like a relief. Because what happens when the sheep isn't shorn 
is summer comes. And they're not capable of like, I grew up with a German shepherd, and what would happen in summer is its winter coat would come off. You'd, you'd, you'd comb it, and literally clumps of the old hair would come off. And it would grow back. In the, it, for the next winter. This doesn't work on humans, by the way. <laughs> it's gone. It's not coming back. So, the, the wool, which was so beneficial for that sheep in the winter time, would become a curse in the summer. You see that? A stale blessing is a curse. What do I mean? A stale blessing is a curse. The manna that was daily given to the Jews in the desert, if they tried to hold it and save it, would become, what? Spoiled and rotten. And, and, and um, the, the Jews, uh, the, the, the Lord used uh, the, the snake on the cross to heal the people. But later on, the people were worshiping it. Remember that? And committing idolatry. It became like a relic, something that they worshiped instead of the true God. And so I want us to learn the idea that holding on to something for too long can become stale and become a curse. Some of us try to hold things in our house and times and situations in our life until it stinks, and we have to let it go. It's time for a new season. None of us appreciated that two inches of rain yesterday, except people who are allergic to all the pollen. And they woke up and their nostrils are clear. And the ground would be so dirty if there was never rain here. Not to mention cars and the need for everything else to get a clean once in a while. And so, the Lord sends affliction. He sends trouble to us. Nothing that he himself hasn't gone through in spades. But he sends that to us. While we don't like it at the time, it's for our lasting good. It's for our good. Before we eat, many of us say a blessing. Before you face a trial or a situation, I advise the same thing. Say that blessing. Sometimes we forget that everything we have from Him is a gift. If you have a gift from God, if you have a... If, Let's just say somebody loaned you something. Someone loaned you something. Maybe a lawnmower or something, a shirt, a dress. And you go and you use that dress. And then you'd go to the dance or whatever you want, or you mow your lawn. And then you come back with the thing. Is it right when you bring it back to that person to be crying and moaning and just, just a baby that I have to return this? You, you, you see what I'm saying? When God gives us something, it's a gift. It's a loan. It's on borrow. It has to be returned. It's not right for us to cry and moan. Your children are not your own. They are a gift from God. Everything you have is a gift from God. The breath in your lungs is a gift from God. Now, there are positives in the affliction. The sheep are shorn in the spring, right before summer. God's trials are never beyond what we can bear, and he always will give us the strength to bear it. When the sheep are shorn... There's an old saying that the, you know, the Lord tempers the wind of the shorn sheep. I think the first thing is, is to, to, that they be shorn in the right season, like I've already made that point. But I think another thing is about a sheep that's lost its coat is that 
You have to understand that if it does have wind, the wind can only come in one direction at a time. Unless it's a hurricane, which is an exception, you don't get wind from the south and from the north at the same time. It doesn't make any sense. Right? Wind is from a high pressure to a low pressure system, or whatever. And so my point is that you're not going to have wind in every direction at the same time. And if he did do that, he'd give you the double and triple strength anyway. He shears us not to injure us. Let it be noted. He does this for our sake. Then there's the point when God takes away mercy from us. When he takes away that mercy, he gives us more. Because after the sheep is shorn, what happens to the sheep? The wool grows back. The wool grows back. And, and many of us have had changes in our life, and then when we look back, we see how faithful he has been the next chapter in our life. And so he's the ultimate example to us. You see, you can say, but it's just so painful, the situation I'm going through. And I understand it is. But that is the ultimate essence of discipline. <laughs> That's the essence of it. If a father said, I'm going to discipline you, son. Um, here it is. Here's a big bowl of ice cream. And uh, here's your favorite candy bar. And then afterwards, just play video games all day. Oh, that sounds interesting. I think I'll sign up for that. What do I have to do to get that punishment? So, the idea of it is that, that that is the point. You know what the real pain of when a sheep is being shorn? The real pain is if it doesn't hold still. If you're not holding still and they've got these very sharp scissors, what's going to happen when you move into the scissors? You're going to have your flesh cut. And so when you resist against him, you're missing. And there's something about this idea. Remember I said he's not the scissors, but he's holding it? Have you ever seen a, an aggressive dog and a person has a stick? What does the dog do 99% of the time when somebody comes at a dog with a, an aggressive dog and they take a stick? What does the dog do? Do they bite the man? They bite the stick, right? Why? Because dogs are stupid. You should bite the hand of the person holding the stick, and they drop the stick. I would. I hope you get my point here. That don't just say, oh my gosh, this is the second cause. Look at this happened. This was my cousin. This was my brother. This is my own mother did this to me. Look behind the stick. God is still there. But this is what makes it so hard. Well, only a friend can betray a friend. Some guy you never met before goes, you're a loser. You'd say, yeah, whatever. Have the worship team come up. What is my takeaway? I talked about Christ as the example. I talked about Christ as the victim. And then I wanted to, uh, lost my page here, but I wanted to speak about the lessons. What, what's, what's the lesson? The lesson is, that silence, submission in the kingdom of heaven is the sign of great strength and being just like Jesus. It's altogether different than what the world is saying. It is not what the world tells you you should do, but it's something altogether different. 
There will be and there are afflictions, trials, sufferings, and situations that all of us are in right now. How we respond, defensive, complaining, or silent, will have a big effect on how the outcome turns out and how we behave in these situations. He's our example. He wants us to walk in his footsteps. He became a sheep so that he would show us how we should be. He became a man. And then as the team, as the team comes up, I just want to take a second to just Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never decided to make him the Lord of your life. If Jesus came at me with a whole bunch of books of do's and don'ts and yelled and screamed at me, I'm sure I would be resistant to the end. But whenever I lashed out at him and he only had a kind word back for me, it just broke my hard heart. It just broke this person. And so if that's you today, if you've never done that, given your life to Jesus, said, that's the person I want to follow. I, that, I never heard about that Jesus. I didn't know that's how Jesus was. Just, just such an attractive, beautiful spirit. I can bend my knee to that man, to that God. Come over here, we'll play with you. If you have a trial or affliction or a suffering and you need help or need to rededicate yourself, come up here and we'll pray with you as well. If you need prayer, please don't hesitate to come forward. Come forward, receive a prayer, okay? You heard the message, why we sing. Feel free to come and receive a prayer, amen? Hallelujah. Let's sing this over ourselves, over our families. In the name of Jesus power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus to every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom Shine to the shade. 
speak the name of Jesus over our families. Why not over a city of low, every corner, need Jesus. Our streets, people walk around with no direction, lost. Oh, they need Jesus, my friend. They need Jesus. We need to speak the name of Jesus over our families, over our city, and our streets, our homes. Hallelujah. So Jesus on the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. the city, Lord, the city of the Lord, the Drake, it all surrounds. We pray and we call salvation. We call deliverance. Break the chains, Lord. Visit every single house, every single family, all the streets in here in the city, Lord. Be visited, be changed, be touched by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the one who convinces us of our sins. Oh, we call the Holy Spirit today, this morning. Visit all our homes here, Lord. Every corner, our youth, our kids, teenagers, Lord, they are lost. Oh, with Holy Spirit, they speak to their hearts. They speak to their hearts, Holy Spirit, to the heart of the youth. Call them by their names, call them by their names, Lord, and change their lives forever. Oh, I know you have power, Lord. I believe in the power of the name of Jesus. Visit our kids. Visit the hospital, Lord, those who are fighting for their lives. Visit every room in this hospital, low general, all clinics. Visit the patients, the doctors, nurses. Visit them, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Your name.
Guys, that's not the whole story. That lamb to the slaughter, that sheep that was shorn, that's not the whole story. There's another part. There's another part. And you have to stay tuned next week for the rest of the story. Go forth in peace. Remember Jesus. Remember the poor. You don't want to miss this Easter. Everybody said amen. 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 So before you guys leave, next Sunday, next Sunday, you all, all of you are invited to come. Amen. All of you, please, please come. Come. We have a special service. It's a celebration service. Amen. So come. Don't come alone. Bring yourself. Bring your neighbors, your friends, family, dogs, cats. No, just kidding. <laughs> but bring everybody. Don't come alone. Bring one more for Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.